our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to Festival of Beginnings. Welcome here uh, and the Pasadena campus. It's just a little toasty today, but we're going to be okay. But welcome to Houston and Phoenix and welcome to you watching from all over the globe. We are so excited and happy to be here today that we can worship in this way, that we can worship together and we can celebrate the beginning of another year. Amen. So peace unto you this fine day. Will you join me in prayer? Heavenly God, we are thankful for who you are, the way maker, the peacemaker, the promise keeper. We are thankful for who you are, and we are thankful for what you have done through your son, Jesus Christ. We are thankful here at Fuller that you have brought together people from all over the globe, to train and to be trained, to form and to form people, to form other people into the very image and likeness of Jesus for your kingdom work all over the world. Like the yeast that the woman hides in the dough, your kingdom permeates everything. And we are thankful and honored just to be a part of that. Lord, in this moment, wherever we may be sitting right now or standing, watching, may we worship, may we hear from you, may we receive the word that we need for this journey, which is theological and psychological higher education. And Lord, we will give our lives, we will offer back to you all that you've given to us in the service of your kingdom. And all God's children said, amen.
Please join with me in a responsive reading of the Beatitudes from Matthew chapter 5. The words are printed for you in your program and read along in the words in bold. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And after he'd sat down, his disciples came to him. And opening his mouth, he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. And blessed are you when people say all kinds of evil things against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because your reward in heaven is great. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning and welcome to Festival Beginnings. We're so, so grateful that we have the chance to be together in worship and the text that has been chosen for today is a text that I think just resounds perfectly in the spirit and intent of a whole year in which we're going to be thinking about issues of formation central to Fuller's life and an opportunity to think about this particular text as a, as a permanent grounding of our life in Christ. As we come to the word, let's just ask for God's guidance. Lord, in your mercy, Lord, in your mercy, Lord, in your mercy, speak to us, we pray. Amen. There's an old adage that says a text without a context is easily a pretext. So let me set the Beatitudes a little bit in context. Matthew's gospel is a gospel that, uh, that I think is really a gospel of surprise. From the very beginning chapter, there are shockwave after shockwave after shockwave of something that feels on the one hand familiar, but on the other hand, extremely disruptive. In the genealogy, a classic Hebrew form of text, yet here are the names of four unexpected women. And it leads to the birth of Joseph, who it turns out actually has nothing to do with the birth of the Messiah. A surprise and a shock. Then certainly the virgin birth, the announcement of the reality, that not only is there going to be a birth of a very unique kind, but actually it turns out that it's going to be the one who is the savior of us all. Shock again. And so the shocks continue to go as the gospel of Matthew unfolds. The wise men come, suggesting that the news of this birth is not just for Israel, but somehow has implications far, far beyond Israel itself. And the wise men representing that sense of astronomical observation, attention to the world, comes to the vortex of power, Herod, and asks where this, this Messiah was to be born. This is a direct challenge to Herod, who easily is a, one of the more paranoid people of the first century. And clearly, it's in this moment that then he suddenly gives attention, wanting to supposedly come and visit the baby in order that he might pay homage. But of course, his intentions are much more deceitful than that. And the first genocide mentioned in the New Testament unfolds in this context as an expression of t Herod's fear and terror. First, immigrants as the Holy Family flees to Egypt. The next section in the massacre of the infants. The next section in a return from Egypt. The next section in the proclamation of John the Baptist, this wonderful bee-eating, hairy-dressed man not unlike what we are all wearing, some of us are wearing this morning that feels in that same way, making this outrageous and bold and confrontational message that he is preparing the way for the one who is going to make the mountains plain. An amazing, an amazing moment, but not any greater for sure than the baptism of Jesus, who in retrospect we would now wonder what the necessity of the baptism was. But then you come also to the temptation of Jesus, the, this extraordinary encounter in the desert, echoing, of course, Israel's whole life. Then you come to this experience of Jesus calling his first disciples in this bold and direct and 
unin uninformed way in the sense that the text certainly does not give us any explanation. He didn't create a rationale. He didn't say, come and do these five things. It was just come and follow me. It was a personal call. And then at the end of this long drum roll, chapter four, just before the Sermon on the Mount, we read this. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, which he had said was coming, and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. So his fame spread throughout all of Syria, and they brought to him all the sick, those who were afflicted with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, and paralytics, and he cured them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. It's only in light of all of that that we then come to this moment, the first sermon of first of five bodies of teaching in Matthew's gospel, and it starts in this really unexpected way. If we imagine this to be Jesus' first church planting sermon, it's full of surprise. It begins in this unexpected way. If it was a symphony, it would be in minor chords in the violins and cellos very, very quiet. If it was a dancer, it would be a person perhaps in an embrace of stillness and wonder, but also isolation and uncertainty, empty handedness. If it was a painter, it would be perhaps a minimalist painting that would, that would have some indication of the person's struggle, but also this incredible sense of void. And it's in a context like that that Jesus says, first, the crowds gathered around him, central to our formation at Fuller is that very beginning, that we are, I pray, as an institution, always seeking to gather at the feet of Jesus. This is always where our degrees, our education, our scholarship, our research papers, our ministries, our activities, our conversations will best begin at the feet of Jesus. They gather there, and then Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This beginning to the Beatitudes, which you know, unfolds, I would suggest, in this very quiet way. It mounts in sound and volume and dynamic as the Beatitudes unfold, ever more vivid, ever more full of action, ever more full, again, of the sense of what this will lead to. But it begins with this simple affirmation, there are blessings for the poor in spirit. And in particular, Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I think in a way you could say that this is the beginning and the ending of how Jesus understands the kingdom of God. It is always about people who are prepared to admit and acknowledge and confess and lament and celebrate that we are actually, in fact, empty-handed. All of us are invited to come to the beginning of this new year empty-handed. I encourage you to come empty-handed to your classes. I encourage you to become empty-handed in your relationship with others. Not because there aren't great things that you can in time and ways find plenty of opportunity to manifest and express, but because in fact in the humility of simply acknowledging that before we are anything else, before we get up from our bed every morning to acknowledge, I, I really have little to bring to the day in light of all that the day holds. This morning I was struck as I often am when I read various newspapers from around the world and the country, which is part of my opening beginnings of the days, and I'm just overwhelmed at the scale of need that there is. And even as we gather here, the waves and the waters are battering Florida. Lives are being turbulently undone as we speak. We are here in, yes, the warm sunshine, but I see no waves, no flooding, no evidence that we are in that circumstance. But the people in Florida today and the people in Myanmar today and the people in Uganda today and the people that are in Ukraine today are people that are battered. They're poor in spirit because the reality of the circumstances simply isn't enough for them to rise to the occasion and say, I will do it. No, if we are clear-minded, if we understand who we are, we are dust and to dust we will return. There is this grounding humility, but it's with a blessing. Who would have imagined that the poor in spirit are the ones who are actually the inheritors of the kingdom? This is the pairing that goes on throughout all of the Beatitudes. The unexpected people 
who are then given unexpected blessings. And the dynamic between these two things is what actually maintains and motivates and the engine that drives our hope. We bring our poverty of spirit, and yet God gives us an inheritance greater than we could even imagine. We bring the fact that we are mourning, as a number of people that I know personally today are in the depths of the first wave of loss of a spouse or parent or child. People who today are in deep mourning, you may be among them, I may be among them, for they will be comforted. There's this amazing pairing. The depth of our need is never greater than the groundedness and the fullness of the reality of God's blessing. As our first song suggested, there's lots of times when, in fact, we don't understand and get the connection, where we long and ache and hurt and cry out, and yet we're not really sure where God is present. We're not really sure that God is attentive. We're not really sure that he's actually doing anything about what most burdens us on any given day, either individually or collectively. And yet the persistence of this kind of rising, motivating, empowering climax of a set of Beatitudes leads us through many moods, many moments, many kinds of circumstances, and in each of them, the affirmation of Jesus is there is blessing. I just want to say before you take uh, the first quarter, if you're starting at Fuller, or your second or third or tenth or whatever it might be that is your quarter, wherever you are in the landscape of the years that you can spend sometimes at Fuller, let me just say, before you perform, before you show up, before you're brilliant or find yourself inadequate, before any of that, you are blessed. You are blessed by a God who sees you in this reality. I remember when I came to Fuller as a student, low, more years ago than I will name, it was so clear to me that I had so far to go. Both as a Christian and as an adult, I didn't yet have a full brain Tom's frontal cortex. <laughs> I needed every help I could get. My brain was still developing. I literally didn't know many things about simply existence, life, myself. And my years at Fuller were such significant years. The very first quarter, I remember writing a paper on Psalm 116, where the psalmist simply cries out and says in the most basic of terms, Lord, save me. That's where every day begins. That's where our best days as faculty begin. That's where our best days as students, as worship leaders, as staff, as administrators, our very best days begin with that simple cry, Lord, save me. The mounting reality of the blessing, however, is not just there. Again, as we see in the first four of the attitudes, especially this quiet sense of an emerging God who pursues those who are poor in spirit, those who mourn, those who are meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's here we begin to get more of the active sense of what the people are that are being blessed. They are awakening, they are craving, they are hungry. So much of the work of our lives is understanding our appetites, as Augustine nurtured and encouraged us to do, that there, is a, there are appetites within us, there are hungers that we have, and we have been made with a hunger that only God can fulfill. Here, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful who actually act with mercy toward others. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will actually see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, those who actually are the bridge builders, the, the ones who make things whole, the, one who, the ones who nurture and encourage a reality at a moment that is divided or hostile. But then it gets even more vivid. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. There is in the Beatitudes a kind of arc or a mounting crescendo or a picture that emerges that is ever more vivid, ever more filled, ever more dynamic, ever more perplexing and sometimes hostile and unsure. And in the middle of all that, 
there is this incredible affirmation again and again and again, even in the vortex of persecution and suffering, that God will be present. I helped facilitate a group that we call Rethinking Church. It's one of those groups. There's three of these, but one of them is an international group. About 25 or 30 people from around the world, all different countries, 50% of whom live under dictatorship. When you ask them what does it mean to rethink church in this era, their number one concern is what does it mean to be a church that lives in persecution and suffering. Somehow in every American poll, there's very little of that. Very little of the sense that fundamentally what defines us is persecution and suffering. And whatever the internal challenges we have, we have to face ourselves. And the challenges that the church in America and around the world faces is not only persecution and suffering, but a lost identity, a failure to actually live our identity, an unwillingness to actually begin as those who are poor in spirit, who inherit the kingdom of heaven, who are not people who simply mirror the culture and baptize it with Christian language. It's about transformation or formation at the core that's required. What Jesus is going to be doing here is laying a foundation of affirmations that actually guide to the core what he goes on to say in the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, but what also unfolds through the rest of the Gospel of Matthew. Again and again and again, this is the, the beginning point of a, of a process of transformation. And at the very end, as you know in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus will say, all authority on heaven, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now go and do the gospel, live the gospel, proclaim the gospel, make disciples. It's always fascinated me that at the end, after all that has been laid with the imagery of 12 disciples, 12 disciples, a new Israel, now we come to this critical moment. And as the text simply says, and then Jesus gathered with the 11 not 12, it's less than it would have been desired, who believed and doubted, 11 believing doubters. That's the identity of the church. That's what the Beatitudes are hinting at. This is where it all begins. So whatever mission and ministry we may be called to, whatever educational process that we're going to engage, whatever circumstances and hurdles and difficulties and suffering are going to occur, all of that points to the reality of a God who actually is going to use 11 believer doubters to change the world. All of us are to be part of that. We're, we're now the 11 believer doubters. We're now the ones who sometimes believe and sometimes don't, who sometimes have great confidence and sometimes are quite shaky. We have questions and we should ask the questions and we have doubts and we should acknowledge our doubts and we have pains and suffering and, and all kinds of circumstances that we encounter. And all of that is exactly the point of the kingdom of God. We bring it all. And as we begin this year, we think about the future of Fuller. It's grounded here. If Fuller was to lose its identity in any way, it could be measured by the Beatitudes. If we wonder where we are and what we're doing and if we're really doing the things that are first and foremost for Jesus and for the kingdom of God, Friends, this beginning is a beginning of a new year. It's a beginning of Fuller's 75th year. It's a beginning of looking forward to the great gift of a new president. It's looking forward to all that's going to unfold. But in the end, it must be like it's supposed to be in the beginning. That we start in this fundamental sense that we simply are blessed. And so let me say to you, brothers and sisters in Christ, students, faculty, staff, administrators. You are blessed. And the God who blesses us starts in the quietest, quietest and most sometimes abandoned places. And the God will also accompany us when in the course of our ministry and journey, the challenges become more painful than we could ever imagine. And where the glory and joy of following Jesus is more vivid than we have yet known. This is part of a life of blessing inside a God who is a realist, inside a God who knows us, inside a God who will not let go, and a God is, who is always, always full of surprise. Lord, may we receive the blessing this morning of this text, the blessedness. I look out on this community, and I know people whose lives 
they are marks of these Beatitudes in ways that have profoundly changed me. I'm different because of the way you have blessed these friends and colleagues. I'm thankful for the fact that you're present with us in this moment as we continue to worship you this morning. May we do so celebrating your blessing. Sometimes it's vivid and overpowering. Sometimes it can seem dim and opaque. May we bring all of ourselves together individually and as a community to you, the one who blesses relentlessly, persistently, and forever. so many to put an event on like this to run this seminary and one very important part of our community is our staff and our administration so I ask all of our staff and administration to open your hands to receive this prayer Lord you have brought us to this new beginning as we anticipate all that lies ahead we ask for your blessing over staff and administration in the year to come. And every detail addressed and every email answered and all the planning and execution of all of our dreams and goals, as we carry them out, we pray for your presence. We pray for your patience with us. We pray for your blessing in everything that we do. May our work and the details find resonance with the detailed work of creation. We are so thankful, Lord, for all those who tend to the needs of this community. Bless the work of our hands. Amen. Let's sing this together. Be thou my wisdom.
are so thankful for our wonderful faculty. All faculty here and online, please open your hands to receive this prayer. God, we ask for your blessing over our faculty in each lesson prepared, in each class taught, in research and in study. Give us guidance as we are guides to our students. Prepare us with understanding coupled with faith and encourage us in the role that we play in our community. We are thankful, Lord, for the gift of teaching and scholarship. Amen. Would you join us again in singing, Riches I Need? students in both schools along here and online open your hands to receive this prayer Lord bless our students returning in you near and far away we pray that you would meet them in every page read every paper written every question considered when they're met with challenges offer them imagination and insight when they feel tired, offer them sustenance and friendship. When they're full and when they're empty, may they find themselves held in your wide embrace. May this be a place and time for continued affirmation and growth in the life of every student who enters our classrooms, in person, anywhere, and online. We're thankful, Lord, for those gifted to study and to seek in our community. Bless them. Amen. We invite you all to stand and sing this last verse together. Let's sing High King of Heaven. as we worship you we just remind ourselves again that you're a god of blessing may everyone in this community near and far be people who live in blessing not in scarcity who live live with imagination for what is beyond what circumstances may tell us not because of fantasy but because of your grace and your mercy and your justice the beatitudes speak to us as communities not only as individuals May we as a community walk in this light and receive the good blessing that you alone can give. 
Now to God who is able to do exceedingly abundantly, beyond all that we could ask or even imagine, according to the power that is at work within us, to God be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, both now and forevermore. to worship with you all. Fuller, we have one more song as you guys go from this place. Would you join us in singing Let Us Come? Let us come on one accord to lift up praises to our further down. 
Um, feel free to stick around, take photos, and hang out with our faculty. Thanks for coming. You are released.